Hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, Dr. Balslev has to say. Um, Dr. Anandita Balslev, uh, it's my job to introduce her, so I'm going to do that now. She's engaged in research in consciousness studies and is the founder of the Forum on Cross-Cultural Communication. She directs a program there that focuses especially on the dialogue between science and religion, the meeting of cultures and encounters between world religions. She organized an international conference on cross-cultural communication in association with national institutes in India, and the conference generated significant institutional impacts. Dr. Balsalev works with academic departments at the University of Copenhagen and Aarhus University, and is the recipient of fellowships from the French and Danish governments, the Danish Council on the Humanities, the Freya Project, and the Nehru Foundation. She's a founding member of the International Society for Science and Religion, founding member. Among her publications are articles on Indian consciousness, a study of time in Indian philosophy and cross-cultural self-image. She was a featured presenter at the 2015 Parliament of World Religions. Interesting stuff. I'm very curious to hear her presentation this evening. Just a reminder that you can post questions in the Q&A at any time. And remember that they'll be answered by our respondent, Dr. Jeffrey Long, who you'll meet in a minute. Uh, and remember the chat is disabled, so make sure you're using the Q&A button. And now let's hear Dr. Balsav's pre-recorded presentation. Today's topic is, why is CCC crucial in our time? CCC, let me say at the outset, is an abbreviation for cross-cultural conversation, a designation for a venture that I initiated in the mid nineties. In the very beginning of this book entitled Cross-Cultural Conversation published by Rutledge in 2020, I have said that my interest in CCC is not merely as an academic project, but that it is kindled by my life experiences having lived studied and worked in India, France, USA, and Denmark in that order, besides traveling to various other countries. Among many other things, I often noticed how conflicts in the practical sphere of our collective life is intertwined with the unresolved problems at the conceptual level. In this talk, I intend to focus on some of these concerns and questions and share with you why CCC seems to me to be of crucial importance in our time. Right from the very inception, I have used cross-cultural conversation as an umbrella term. As I have said elsewhere, CCC does not designate exclusively a conversation between huge aggregates of cultures for which the conventional practice is to use such nomenclatures as East and West. What CCC as a venture seeks is an open exchange between diverse groups and subgroups that are located in the center and periphery of any societal scenario, focusing on issues that are of concern to our collective life, be that within any given national or international context. Naturally, this conversation makes room for a variety of topics. In fact, too many to provide a complete list. It may be about cultural attitudes and social practices of various communities, some of which are sanctioned by existing institutions and supported by academic theoretical discourses, as well as with regard to the controversies that ensue from all these. It can be about modes of representations of various thought traditions in different cultural soils, be that scientific, religious, or philosophical, or about the asymmetries and polarities that are generated by diverse forms of social identities. Apart from these few that I've just mentioned, there are many other significant issues that call for a public scrutiny. Hence, 
are to be seen as appropriate topics for CCC. I will return to some of these issues, exemplifying how we radicalize our differences by ignoring uh, all that which is shared and thereby sharpen the we and they divide. As we peruse the global political setting, it becomes evident that we are living in a time when the nation state system of governance is preponderant, where we routinely watch how the we and they divide is played out in the name of national identity. While partaking in this political scenario, we need to keep in mind that this nation state system of governance is not even 300 years old. Emphasizing this point, Ernest Gellner, in his well known work, in Nation and Nationalism, observed, I quote, culture and social organizations are universal and perennial. States and nationalisms are not. This is an absolutely central and supremely important fact. End of quote. Indeed, this is a fact that deserves close attention today from the participants of the CCC, especially those who are engaged in a conceptual struggle so that nationalism and globalism do not continue to be seen as diametrically opposed. Since this happens to be one of those major problems that call for resolution if we are to coexist in a single planet. It seems to me that one salient feature of contemporary world is that formidable effort is being made by all nation states for adopting advanced scientific technology, each to its optimal capacity in order to secure a better future for their respective citizens. And I believe there are about 195 sovereign states that are registered with the United Nations. Thus, a strict adherence to the nation state system of governance combined with unequal technological capabilities have created the complex situation. What further adds to the tension is the growing awareness that advanced scientific technology is channelized not only for constructive, but also for destructive purposes. Actually to serve, sometimes it looks like very demonic goals. Consequently, it is becoming poignantly clear that on the one hand, that we, I am using the word we, uh, globally speaking globally, are moving towards an increasingly interconnected world with unprecedented possibilities for ameliorating the quality of our collective lives. And on the other hand, that unless we work in collaboration toward a change of mindset matching with our current capabilities, there is severe danger from a radicalization of the we and they divide on many fronts, be that within or among the nation states. Indeed, it can hardly be overlooked that despite remarkable progress in terms of travel and communication and various opportunities for considerable betterment in terms of human interrelationships, the global cultural landscape has not altered enough so that we could cease to be socially as disjoint as we still are. Hence, it is time to ask what kind of cultural work that must now be done in collaboration so that we may restore some balance by beginning to probe into our unexamined assumptions and shed off some of our prejudices about the otherness of the other. Note that some of these prejudices 
most of us do have, be that in the context of nationality, ethnicity, gender, race, religion, or any other. It's high time to take note of the fact that the ability to crisscross the globe does not automatically make us better equipped to cope with the long range of intricate issues that confront us at multiple levels of social transactions. Nor does it enable us to deal with the predictable clashes and conflicts of various forms by providing the instruments for empowering our global institutions that seem to remain by and largely dysfunctional. Cross-cultural conversation is called for precisely to give a new direction to the dynamics between self and the other, as well as to mobilize to collective uh, mobilize a collective will, political will, to bring about a change in our mindset. A scrutiny of intergroup behavior shows that we badly need an open conversational setting in the public space, where it is feasible to speak with each other on issues that could be of theoretical or of practical concern. No doubt, top-down injunctions from uh, legal authorities, executives, or from religious institutions, for that matter, can be very helpful. Yet, we must acknowledge that it is not enough. Public involvement and engagement are crucial for attaining socio-cultural transformation. CCC is indispensable. Since, if I may put it that way, human civilization has entered an era when it is no longer enough to speak among ourselves about the otherness of the other, or speak to the other where the other is supposed to remain a silent, passive listener, but that we must learn to speak with each other. Existing educational channels can no doubt do much in response to contemporary challenges, but only if educational offerings could be geared with that intention. It is often the case that politics of knowledge intervenes even for deciding the contents of the curricula. Hence, it is likely to be more fruitful if conversational partners in a CCC forum come not only from within, but also from outside the academia. It seems to me that to have relevant inputs from those with training and background in multiple disciplines is as vital as from the experience of those who come from various walks of life into discussions on topics that are of common concern. Let me elaborate a bit more and as plainly as possible on the idea of CCC. If it is asked, what is it that we are seeking to cross by engaging in this cross-cultural endeavor? And whom do we expect to meet on the other side? The answer lies in becoming aware of the we and they categories that seem to be incessantly appearing in multiple socio-historical contexts within public discourse. These we and the categories almost always imply overtly or covertly a sense of boundary. There are indeed many criteria that are employed for the sake of forming groups and subgroups along the lines of race and religion, ethnicity, nationality, gender, etc. Indeed, we keep inventing newer and newer criteria for doing this for various cult cultural purposes. For example, I may mean by we, those that are attending this IRIS webinar, and as they, those who are not. There is always a boundary that separates us from them, and I do not see anything wrong with it as such. However, 
It is critically important in this connection to note that boundary is only a metaphor, a metaphor that can be used both in its soft sense and its hard sense. The soft sense of the metaphor, as in, in the example I just gave, indicates that there is a border that enables us to speak of our distinctness by distinguishing it from others. Indeed, it is this soft sense of the metaphor of boundary that allows us to recognize and validate diversity and differences that are there in the societies at large. Whereas the metaphor of the boundary in its hard sense is not just that. There the metaphor implies a barrier where crossing is, as it were, trespassing. All nation states, for example, have such boundaries. We need permission to enter the territory of a different nation state. Uh, well, uh, we also read, unfortunately, about cases when a given nation state it denies uh, having any legal or moral responsibility whatsoever toward those who desperately look for help after being driven out from their own territory, perhaps due to hunger, persecution, or threat of war. Indeed, a sad scenario for trespassing a hard boundary drawn in the name of national identity. I'm using this example primarily in order to demonstrate the way hard boundaries actually work. And then also with the intention of underscoring the need for more conversation about possible innovations of political institutions that may not so blatantly clash with human values. In other words, cross-cultural conversation is to be treated as a project that seeks greater participation of people with a view to redesign and ameliorate human interrelationships with due respect, of course, for cultural diversity. The intent is to promote a sense of human solidarity. The goal of CCC is never to homogenize or impose without consent any one of the culture forms on the other but to serve the interest of various forms of social identities in multiple contexts. When an open conversation brings about attitudinal transformation, collaborative effort for innovating social institutions befitting the present state of human civilization can be expected to be more effective. It seems to me that this is a process that entails not only a new way of learning, if you notice the title of my book is Cross-Cultural Conversation, A New Way of Learning, because that's the way we can learn to how to discern and address issues that are of conceptual or practical significance and also enables us to unlearn some of our prejudices. Let's note that wrongdoings, be that in the context of race, religion, gender, ethnicity, etc., are not simply due to the mistakes that some individuals have done or still do. Looking at the historical canvas cross-culturally, it is easy to detect that many of these prejudices are associated practices to be and associated practices to be systemic. It's not confined only to a few individuals. CCC thus is not merely an abstract vision. I felt all along that if we are to give a new direction to the dynamics of the self and the other in social spheres, we not only require imagination to alter strategies, but also a readiness to explore the untapped resources of across cultures that may help us to better deal with these 
issues. It is rather surprising that today, when phrases like, we are living in a global village or in an interdependent world, have gained such popularity that these are now getting incorporated into various political slogans as well, but that it is still so difficult to obtain even a tiny fraction of those enormous resources, intellectual and economic, that are regularly being invested for serving the cause of violence and extreme radicalization of the we and divide. We and they divide. How to account for this dearth of political will for building those cultural bridges that could interconnect human minds by defining our norms and ideals in consonance with the rising global consciousness. Is it not time to openly ask whose interests are best guarded by refraining people from obtaining a sense for a larger identity and by simply letting the global historical record of a long chain of horrors and atrocities to steadily expand. Obviously, the need of the hour is to create and protect that space where such questions can be asked, as it is only then that a change in mindset can happen. Enabling innovations of new tools of social engagement that might eventually render all hard boundaries to become redundant. Hard boundaries between we and they affect our collective lives profoundly. They are the fulcrums for justifying divisive policies, for perpetuating social structures that shape and nurture discriminatory social behavior. In the worst case scenarios, these hard boundaries induce communal riots, racial genocides, ethnic cleansing, and even war. Although all forms of social identities along the line of race, religion, gender, nationality, etc., deserve careful scrutiny for prevailing social injustice, it seems to me that perhaps the most abominable atrocities that continue to be openly created, uh, openly committed today uh, on a massive scale happen in the name of religious and national identities. The reason why I have particularly these topics in my book and would also like to uh, briefly refer to in this talk with the intention of inviting more uh, discussions in the future. As I said earlier, we live in an era when despite all cultural differences, the nation state form of governance is predominant in the current global setting. You may read in my book where I have briefly pointed out the various reasons for the extraordinary reception of this idea of nation state governance around the globe, as well as the inherent limitations of these paradigms for achieving global peace. I have alluded to a views of a few great um, thinkers from India and the West in order to highlight the tension between nationalism and globalism that has both a political and ethical dimension to it. The fact is that today nationalism is a full-fledged political category, whereas globalism is still by and large a moral category. This situation provides a crucial challenge to all thinking minds and calls for extensive conversations cross-culturally for transcending the disadvantages entailed in this dominant paradigm of nation state system of governance. Despite all its merits, we witness time and again situations when global situ institutions fail either to prevent or to manage conflicts. Uh, 
and these global institutions it seems to me are virtually rendered very often pretty powerless by national self-interest this is obviously not a simple task and would need much imagination and skill even to conceptualize a system of governance that can adapt to the increasing global consciousness that uh, you know taking to full account the fact that we are really moving into uh, moving toward an interconnected world in every sense the range of problems that we are facing today requires joint action be that uh, removing uh, water and air pollution or uh, degradation of soil striving to have clean energy you name it there are so many problems before us and all these are possible to solve uh, only if we work in collaboration with the same intent in such a world as we have today a better future for all cannot be attained by pushing policies toward fragmentation or by inventing newer and near forms of tribalism we have to learn to make most of the rich and diverse cultural experiences that we today have when those who earlier were strangers have become our neighbors today let me now turn to another very important topic namely religious identity this is a theme that needs close attention since in, in its it is in its name that horrendous atrocities have taken place not only in our past but also still continue today religious identity is a multifaceted phenomenon here is a notion of identity generally associated with one or another world religions which is also very often used as a criterion for demarcating humanity into large aggregates it is noteworthy that today just as a nation may declare itself to be multi-religious a specific world religion may also well claim to be transnational since multi multiple nations can and actually do share the same religious identity along with its various denominations no doubt that these have huge uh, impact on various levels of exchanges and transactions be that social economic political or legal indeed a common sharing of advanced scientific technology has created a novel situation especially the urban setting around the globe as societies are becoming multi-religious in their demographic composition this is of no minor significance in the contemporary political setting uh, which is dominated uh, globally by uh, this nation state system of governance since this system makes room for ongoing immigration of people from one part of the globe to another people who are bearers of different religious identities note that when people move across vast geographical distances they carry with them not only their respective regional culinary practices their art music and dance but also their religions it is highly relevant to take note of the fact that for many people their sense of primal identity is associated with their religions and perhaps for most people despite prevalent anti-religious ideologies they continue to derive their norms and values from ancient religious discourses that are handed down from generation to generation indeed it is to these religious traditions 
that most of us turn for seeking guidelines for their for our this worldly as well as other worldly concerns and questions that inevitably arise in the face of an inescapable death bound existence interestingly the presence of diversity does not seem to cause much anxiety in many areas of our collective life, but rather it is often much appreciated, as such as in the case of sharing art, music, dance, food, etc. However, there is somewhere a sense of uneasiness, a cultural gap, particularly because we still have not found out how to deal with religious diversity and cope with the various ramifications of the phenomenon of religious identity. One obvious reason is that our educational channels, by and large, have not been active in this direction. Since information about world religions has not been generally considered to be as important uh, as uh, economics, politics, law, even by those who are engaged in international relations. Consequently, very few of us have even basic minimum knowledge about the religions of the world, other than those with which we are connected with right from our birth, let alone about the rich cognitive calm wisdom traditions associated with the world religions for centuries. It is indeed crucially urgent to fill this lacuna in our time, given that religious difference has not only been in the past, but still is subject to manipulation. Today, any such ploy can be simply disastrous for any multi-religious society. In this connection, let me here draw attention to a commonplace practice with regard to uh, uh, especially conflict situations but also otherwise it is this that we find especially in a conflict situation that uh, when a specific group is targeted in the context of a larger assembly of groups most often an abstract otherness is obtained simply by viewing the members of that group through a single identity, such as when we describe a group of people only in terms of their religious identity. Uh, and we do this by underplaying the other multiple social identities, such as national identity, ethnic identity, and all that. These are all overlooked because these are the shared identities. Purely some leaders, I must say, also do indulge in this practice. And I call this practice um, as monocategorization of people. That is, you categorize people under one heading. And they can, it, this can be done also, sometimes this is done actually, uh, sometimes for beneficial endeavors with the aim of bringing about a moral resurgence of a marginalized or oppressed groups be that in the context of a gender or race, that one is reminded of that identity, that one is reminded that some protest needs to be done, etc. However, very often and most often this practice of focusing on single identity is used simply as a divisive tool to the detriment of others, where the other is seen uh, and depicted not just as different, but as inferior or even maligned as an enemy. We need to carefully observe the intention whenever such vocabularies are employed by our leaders for depicting the otherness of others. A review of religious riots, for example, be that between members of two denominations of the same religion, or that of two different religions does show that the contending groups of people 
even having the same ethnicity, speaking the same language, etc., have inflicted enormous suffering on each other in the name of religious differences alone by ignoring all that is shared. With this word of caution, let me move on to the next point and observe that today CCC on the meeting of world religions is just as important as the interrelationship between science and religion, precisely because there are profound ethical challenges associated with these topics. Since this webinar is hosted by IRIS, Institute on Religion in the Age of Science, I would like to strongly recommend to the IRIS program committee to devote at least a couple of summer conferences focusing on different aspects of these two large themes. Given that I have now made some points about why meeting of religions is urgent, and we have also discussed during this past IRIS summer conference in 2022, some of the things. Uh, but let me at least now ask why CCC on science religion dialogue is relevant and necessary in our time. Today, if there is a keen awareness with regard to this remarkable progress in scientific pursuits over the past decades in a range of areas, along with how advanced scientific technology has paved the way towards a better life and greater well being of many of us living on this planet this time, there is also a shared perception that advanced scientific technology and knowledge are also employed for, as I said before, destructive purposes, endangering a natural environment, bringing about climate change, not to speak of their pivotal role in the innovation of lethal weaponries. This has enhanced the, our capacity for inflicting horrendous amount of human suffer, suffering. Uh, and uh, uh, even uh, potentially, you know, it can be considered to be instrumental toward possible destruction of the entire planet. And this is no wild fantasy, since most of the incredibly destructive scenarios that we witness today are not due to natural catastrophes, but happen to be man-made. All the wars, since a lot of intellectual and economic resources are purposely invested to make these happen. Today, a deranged teenager can act as a one-man army, shoot and kill dozens within minutes because of the sophisticated gun, a piece of technological wonder that he carries. We see no global institution that can stop a professional army from marching into the territory of a nation state and wipe out cities in the course of a few days that have taken centuries to come to its present form along with all culture and history. These deadly weapons surely are all invented with the aid of cutting edge scientific technology and promptly distributed for the sake of huge profits. These descriptions are not hypothetical situations, but are corroborated by news channels reporting on daily events around the globe. Today, when we repeat that almost proverbial phrase, knowledge is power, it really seems worthwhile to pay heed to the warning that came from Burton Russell almost half a century ago. He reminded us that knowledge is power, but it is power for evil just as much for good. And then he continued to say, it follows that unless men increase in wisdom as much as in knowledge, increase of knowledge will be increase of sorrow. For science religion dialogue to be relevant, to human society today is urgent not only to highlight the benefits of scientific knowledge but also to lay bare how it can draw 
from and abide by the profound insights from our religious traditions, which are our principal wisdom traditions. We must find a way to resist the actual and possible abuse of scientific technology as power for evil. Let's not forget the advantages that we all share today in our collective lives, which in many ways make us more fortunate than our ancestors. We are no longer living in an era when some could proclaim institutional authority in the name of religion with the view either to control the march of scientific enterprise or to impose any blind acceptance of hideous custom-based social practices. Nor are we obliged to listen to those who arrogantly declare that we now live in an age of science. So we can uh, uh, consider our wisdom traditions to be at best minor or uh, to play minor or marginal role in our lives. Our cumulative experience of the past many centuries have shown to us that we need both for the sake of our collective well-being. I believe that the establishment of science religion forums today are testimony to that perception. Let me reiterate from a paper that I wrote and which was published in Zygon in 2015, where I said that today, neither a religious or not a scientific community must insist on being uh, the sole repository of knowledge and wisdom. Indeed, science and religion together constitute the forces that can bring about major transformation in our collective life, transcending all borders, geographical and cultural, and thereby can engender a sense of optimism. Uh, this is bound to be so when the conversational partners are determined to remove the prevailing asymmetries. The space for cross-cultural conversation must be protected with the intent to imagine a new phase of human civilization. It is for us to mobilize the political will so that we may innovate new ways of thinking and acting in our everyday transactions so that no part of human suffering is purposely man-made. Now let me wrap up this discussion here by returning to the designation of CCC once again. In the beginning, I've dealt with the question, what is it that we are seeking to cross by engaging in CCC and whom are we intending to meet on the other side? And discussed the soft and the hard sense of the metaphor of boundary. And these boundaries are always designed to sustain the we and the divide, uh, and the we and the categories, but with various intents, some of which are quite noble and some are not so. For the CCC venture, respect for cultural diversity is vital. And it goes hand in hand with the aim to forge a sense of human solidarity. At this juncture, it may be asked, do we become more cultured by engaging in cross-cultural conversation? My reply is in the affirmative, but only if we understand it in the Socratic sense of being cultured. That is when conversation makes one aware of the limits of one's own knowledge. When that happens, it does not provoke any display of arrogance, but inspires a sense of modesty. This view is equally confirmed in the Indian tradition where it is said, Vidya Dadati Vinayam, that is, knowledge generates humility. At the very end, let me also mention that there are those skeptics who say that we need to wait for this conversation to take place until the forces that create asymmetries subside 
allowing suitable conditions to arise. I do not agree. Since I believe that the system that creates polarities and asymmetries also seeks to perpetuate the same until and unless it is opposed. Said in a very different context, the words of Turgenev seems very appropriate for closing this discussion. He said, if we wait for the moment when everything, absolutely everything is ready, we shall never begin. Indeed, we must engage in CCC. It is absolutely crucial in our time. Thank you. Well done. Lots to think about there. Next, we our respondent, Dr. Jeffrey Long, will um, provide his thoughts about what we just heard. Dr. Jeffrey D. Long is the Carl W. Ziegler, Ziegler, Ziegler Professor of Religious Studies at Elizabethtown College, just a stone's throw from where I'm sitting. That is, if you can throw a stone about 25 miles. Dr. Long teaches religion and Asian studies, specializing in the religions and philosophies of India. He's the author of several books and numerous articles, and he edits the series Explorations in Indic Traditions for Lexington Books. In 2018, he received the Hindu American Foundation's Dharma Seva Award for his ongoing efforts to promote more accurate and culturally sensitive portrayals of Indic traditions in the American educational system and popular media. Dr. Long has spoken in numerous venues, both national and international, including at Princeton, Yale, the University of Chicago, and Nehru University in India. He's also presented three talks at the United Nations. So he has a very impressive background. Uh, before I let him go ahead, I wanna remind you once again that you can post questions regarding Dr. Valslev's presentation or Dr. Long's response at any time in the Q&A window, not the chat window. Dr. Long, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on Dr. Valslev's presentation. Take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. I hope I'm uh, audible. Uh, you can, everyone can hear me okay? Um, yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. I'm coming through loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I, I hope I can live up to <laughs> everything that you've just said. Uh, so uh, I want to first express my gratitude to Anindita, to Dr. Boslev, uh, for appointing me in this role to really uh, uh, sit in her place uh, and uh, both respond to uh, what she has presented, and then to uh, be able to, you know, presume to answer questions uh, that might come about uh, uh, based on her presentation or based on my own uh, response to that presentation. Uh, my response is uh, a supportive one. Uh, I, uh, I won't say that I'm particularly critical of what uh, Anindita has uh, said here. I'm very much in support of this idea of cross-cultural conversation. Uh, what I mainly want to do is highlight particular portions of her presentation that I think uh, really underscore uh, the importance of this project and that delve into some elements of it uh, in, in a little bit more depth. Uh, I believe uh, it's probably quite uncontroversial to say that we live in a highly polarized world where there's an enormous amount of cross-cultural misunderstanding and if we can broaden that concept of culture out uh, in much the way that Anindita herself does and indicate that we're talking about a wide range of things, we're talking about religious difference, we're talking about nationalisms, we're talking about ethnocentrisms of various kinds. And uh, there is also, of course, the division, uh, the economic division, uh, the uh, uh, increasingly wide disparity between those who have an enormous amount of wealth and those who have relatively little. And all of these lines of conflict are occurring uh, simultaneously. They're overlapping simultaneously. Uh, they are in many ways being intensified by information technologies because uh, we are now able to communicate uh, with people around the world instantaneously. This webinar itself uh, is an example of that, uh, how through technology we're able to reach uh, many people. Uh, we might have every reason to expect that this 
technology would facilitate the kind of conversation that Anindita is, is uh, speaking about. But uh, it's not uh, simply obvious that if we build the technology, the, the positive conversation will happen because what we've seen is that uh, very often it is quite the opposite, that social media particularly has been used as an accelerant uh, toward uh, fueling the fire, of, if you will, of polarization and difference. Uh, the spreading of misinformation happens rapidly now uh, due to uh, the uh, uh, our ability to communicate through the technologies that we've developed. So the fact that we simply have the technology does not obviate the need for CCC, cross-cultural conversation of the kind which Anandita is describing, uh, because it's not simply happening on its own. It's not something that that is a natural outgrowth of the kind of information technology we have. Uh, we still have uh, very deep tendencies toward tribalism, toward what Anandita calls the the we they discourse, the we they dynamic, uh, and whatever in group it may be. Uh, whether we're talking about a religious in-group uh, or some other ideology or something based on ethnicity or nationality, uh, there is a widespread tendency of human beings to, to um, not only build community, which is, I think, an encouraging thing, but to also erect boundaries that then become barriers. I think it was a very important part of Anindita's presentation when she said that boundaries themselves are not necessarily a bad thing. I, uh, if someone has, uh, if a group of people have a common set of interests, it uh, seems a perfectly good thing for them to form a community around those interests. Uh, Iris is a great example of that. Uh, the science and religion dialogue, something we're all interested in. Uh, if you're not interested in that, then there's no reason for you to particularly be in this community. So that boundary is not itself a problem. It is when the boundaries become hardened. It is when within those boundaries, uh, communities develop uh, ways of keeping out the other and not engaging uh, on the basis of other kinds of interests that we might share. For example, this group is centered around an interest in religion and science. Uh, it could be that some subset of members of this group are also very interested in science fiction. And maybe there are people who are not in this group who are also interested in science fiction. Well, those of us who are also interested in science fiction can be, belong to that community as well, right? We can all belong to multiple communities. We can all have multiple allegiances. The difficulty we face is that there is frequently an insistence, uh, especially from within religion or from within nationalistic or uh, political ideologies, uh, an insistence on exclusive allegiance so that one becomes entirely identified with one particular community, one particular tribal group, and then communication uh, is impeded with other groups. And then it's very easy to uh, have views based on ignorance about the other group and to develop prejudices. Uh, and so conversing across these boundaries is really essential to keeping uh, those lines of communication from breaking down, which really have the potential to bind us all together as a human community. And this is what I see as an Anita's main agenda, uh, promoting the idea of a wider human identity within which all of these other communities and all of these other identities can flourish, but in a healthy way, uh, a way that involves um, openness to mutual influence and uh, currents of thought, uh, not in a way that results in people, you know, shutting themselves into their particular bubbles and hating everyone else, right, to put it very, very bluntly. Uh, when it comes to the topic of religion, particularly, uh, Anandita expresses uh, and acknowledges uh, that it has very often been conducive to precisely this kind of walling off of the other, right? particularly when we come to very exclusive claims that our group alone, whatever it may be, has the path to salvation, has the truth, and so on, uh, that other views are evil or demonic. Well, then right away you have a recipe for people cutting themselves off from others, 
the we they dynamic and the conflict and the violence that can stem from that. Uh, at the same time, she uh, also expresses uh, and acknowledges that there's a great deal of wisdom that has been expressed in the traditions of the world. And that if we, uh, this is not her, her metaphor, but if uh, I, I'm interpreting her, if we throw the baby out with the bathwater, then we don't have uh, a lot of resources available to prevent us from using our technology in very evil, very destructive ways uh, to continue to exacerbate uh, in existing conflicts and uh, the unbridled pursuit of wealth uh, at the expense of the good of other living beings. Sorry, my light just went off. There it went, it came back on. Uh, the, the unbridled pursuit of power uh, these things have nothing to restrain them uh, without the kind of wisdom that we find in, in many of, of the world's traditions. So there needs to be dialogue among religions, but there also needs to be a dialogue between religion and science. And in fact, a term I would like to introduce into Anandita's conversation uh, is the idea of worldviews, because that's really what we are talking about. Uh, the sort of walling off of one set of worldviews and calling them by the name religion. And then we have a various, uh, you know, array of other worldviews that we maybe call secular or non-religious uh, that uh, uh, as a scholar of religion, I can tell you that, that many of us uh, in the Academy of Religion are increasingly skeptical of the utility of the term religion itself, because it can carry with it so many prejudices, so many uh, assumptions that actually get in the way of of uh, dialogue, right? If, if we don't think in terms so much of as the religious and the secular, but if we think in terms of worldviews, then it's uh, it seems much more conducive to a, a kind of sharing uh, across these uh, boundaries of thought, uh, these conceptual boundaries. You know, the term religion suggests that something is sacred and therefore cannot be uh, critiqued, uh, cannot be studied or explored. Uh, but a worldview can be explored. It can be brought out into the open and its strengths and its limitations uh, engaged with. And this kind of conversation is always much more beneficial if it is open, if it is public. And this is another term that Anindita used, the bringing our views out for public scrutiny, that that's what the cross-cultural conversation is about. Um, one thing that she didn't mention, I think it's really uh, assumed uh, in what she's presenting is this is inherently difficult. Uh, we all have cherished views, whether we call those religious or not, uh, that we find difficult to bring out for public scrutiny. Uh, we might not be comfortable in various ways. And this is where the idea of CCC uh, operates on the level of of a individual personal transformation as well. We're talking about societies, nations, religions, uh, but uh, we're also talking about people as individuals. How do we relate to our own belief systems? How do we relate to our own understandings of the world? And one piece of wisdom that I would just like to conclude with, uh, which comes from India, uh, we see this in many of the Indic traditions, and it's especially strong, I find, in the Buddhist tradition, the idea that attachment even to one's own understanding of what is true uh, is itself very often a barrier to understanding, a barrier to wisdom. And a cross-cultural conversation seems to be an invitation to hold our views a little uh, a little less tightly, right? In, in, in a way that does not, uh, doesn't mean we lack conviction, but that means that uh, we're open to the, the understanding that we don't have all knowledge and that our knowledge can be completed and complemented and supplemented and corrected when we engage with the other. So this is what I see Anandita as challenging and inviting all of us to do. And uh, I, uh, endorse her project. I, I think it is uh, something that we would uh, certainly benefit by considering, and I'm grateful that uh, this webinar has been dedicated to it. So thank you. And I think now we can open it to questions. We do have some questions. Um, I'll start with one that I, I think you sort of answered with your examples, which I love, by the way. Um, but just to make sure it gets asked and, and discussed, uh, Elizabeth Bjorkman writes, Am I correct that CCC is a project that encourages a yin-yang dialogue? In other words, that engages contradictory 
and that engaging contradictory categories is necessary in order to achieve a wisdom which promotes global solidarity. So my response to that be would be, and I suspect that Anindita's response to that would be that uh, uh, that would certainly be one kind of cross-cultural conversation. Uh, one could certainly envision a different kind of cross-cultural conversation in, in a different setting where maybe uh, two groups or, or two individuals who think of themselves as radically other actually end up finding they have a lot in common and that they share far more than uh, separates them. But there are certainly those other conversations where people have flatly opposed points of view. And uh, it's really not possible to hold both ideas in one's mind at the same time, uh, but that understanding why the other holds that view, what role it plays in their sense of well-being, their sense of why they're here on earth, uh, is, is an important part of coexistence, right? That, well, those aren't just those strange people over there who believe those weird things because maybe they're not as smart as we are. Uh, that, that kind of patronizing attitude uh, is not helpful in the long run. That we could possibly engage in such a conversation and say, well, I don't really agree with that idea, but I understand why you believe that and why that's important to you. And let us find a way to share the world together where you can pursue that and I can pursue mine. Uh, so I think it does encourage this. I would say the answer to your question is yes, but I don't think that that is all that CCC is about. I think it's, it's an entire project of understanding. Yeah, not limited to contradictory viewpoints conversing. But, but, it, but inclusive of them, right. Uh, right. Yeah. Paul Carr asks, haven't economic business interests led to more cross-cultural cooperation than conversations? For example, Tesla is manufacturing and selling electric vehicles in China and Europe. Japanese automobiles have displaced some American brands. Japan and China now own a lot of US government debt. So I, I think the question he's asking is, are, are these conversations as, um, as likely to have as big an impact as business interests have had in terms of intercultural cooperation? Right, no, that's that's a very rich question. And uh, so I'm, I'm gonna need to go a little bit of length, I think, to, uh, to delve into this. Uh, so going just a little bit, bit of history, uh, as economic globalization really started to take off, and I'm thinking about the 90s, uh, there was a hope, I think, that many of us had that greater business and economic ties would render things like war and tribalism and conflict obsolete. Right? And uh, you know, if you, you look at uh, everyday items that we use, like telephones, computers, and so on, uh, the parts that go into those are from all over the world, right? And uh, there, there is such an incredible interdependence that we do have economically. Ironically, however, what has happened is that uh, even, even though on the business and economic level, there is an enormous amount of interdependence, uh, a couple of things have not happened. Uh, one, the wealth produced by this has not in a uniform way trickled down, as the saying uh, used to be, uh, to, to everyone, right? So there have been societies where some individuals have become very wealthy because of globalization, but maybe the wider population, the working class, uh, has not experienced that benefit, and in some cases have actually suffered uh, under it. Uh, and it seems to me that's more the rule. Yeah, the exactly. Exactly. So then you get the anti-globalization movement, which is precisely centered around that, a movement which really cuts across the political spectrum because you have people more on the left who are looking at the economic disparity. But then you see people on the right also who say, well, this is because we globalized. If we just, you know, put our own country first and, and uh, you know, thought about our own people and the heck with the rest of the world, then we'd be okay. So, th and this is the conversation, I think, where we find ourselves now to some extent. So I think one could say that economic interdependence, I don't think this is necessarily Anindita's view. I personally am inclined to think it, it might be a necessary but not sufficient condition for the kind of united humanity that uh, we're hoping to have. United not in the sense, as Anindita said, not in the sense of homogenized, but in the sense of coexisting as a global community. Uh, 
I think what the current global situation suggests is that we need, need to go beyond the economic uh, cooperation, that that itself has had many benefits, but it, it's been mixed, right? It's been mixed at best, uh, one could argue. Uh, well, some, of course, the homogenization yeah. that has come with that is it has now become normative almost globally. Think norms like private ownership of land and private property and um, capitalism. Well, and it even and it, and it also seeps into culture as well. Um, I've had the good fortune of being able to travel quite a bit in my lifetime, and I think of some of my favorite cities. Uh, I'm thinking of New York, uh, London, and Tokyo, and as diverse and different as those three cities are from each other, there's some generic qualities that they now share because they're basically big globalized cities. And- Same uh, restaurants. <laughs> same restaurants, same restaurant chains, right? People sitting on mass transit, looking at telephones. Uh, there's just, a, um, th there is a kind of global culture emerging and it's not necessarily clear that it's all good, right? I mean, uh, some of it may be, but then, what happens to the richness of you know, something that is local and distinctive and unique to that place if it's not seen as convenient, right? If it, no, if it doesn't fit within that larger global dynamic. So I think the kind of conversation Anandita is talking about is one where we sort of say, well, yeah, but we need to talk about values too, right? What are we building all this stuff for? What is the point finally? And uh, so, I, I think the mention of Tesla is, is a really interesting one. Uh, uh, all, I mean, the entire discourse about Elon Musk aside, I'm just going to bracket him for now. But uh, electric cars, I, that is, I mean, that's a wonderful idea. I mean, the, one of the big sources of, of uh, greenhouse gases are automobiles. And so an economic and social sort of coordinated push for this uh, with, with, of course, it requires the political will as well. And this ultimately is going to be very good, I think, for, for humanity if it's done in the right way. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, there, there's, a, there's enormous potential for us to really uh, do very powerful things uh, in, in a positive way for, for humanity if we're sensitive and attentive to uh, these deeper questions of values, which I think what's happening very often is that people like Elon Musk are just plowing forward, not necessarily without any sort of uh, consideration of, of these uh, bigger global questions. Uh, now, of course, the conversations might slow down progress, some might say, but maybe we need to do that in some cases. Maybe that would be better, right? Uh, when we we're could start with the conversation on what is progress? How do we define progress? Exactly. Does, does exactly. more and more inequality equal progress? Right. Precisely, and th and that is the concern, right? More billionaires, but uh, more homeless people too. Uh, is that a is that a good trade off? Keep those questions coming. Um, we are those were the only two that I have, so um, we could end early. But I'm guessing there are people out there with questions just forming as we speak. So we'll give it another minute. We're you saying provocative heard. stuff, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's so amazing. Far. That's. So I have a question, uh, JD, that I'd like to get in in the absence of any others. Um, and that um, has to do with the uh, emphasis in the United States of individuality. Um, and as much as we like to, um, like to hang on to some of our ethnic and cultural tra traditions, the, the, it conflicts with the with the notion of individuality in the United States, and um, that is that is almost detrimental to what we're talking about here. Um, I, I'd like to have you comment on that, um, uh, Jeff, um, because well, you you, Aris had a conference um, about fifteen years ago that was headed by your colleague uh, at Elizabethtown, John Teskey. And um, you may have been part of that conference. I, I, that's where I met Anandita the first time. Okay. Um, uh, but the, the conference was the myth of the autonomous individual. And it's almost, you know, in this, this matter of the individual, the sanctity of the individual is almost mythic in the United States. And we've seen that emerge 
anew during the pandemic. Um, and in many ways, it's part of the polarization that has taken place. I mean, it has a place there. I would like to just have you comment more about this matter of individuality that is such a mythic position in our culture. Yes, and so there, there are myths that are wise and life-sustaining and affirming, and uh, there are myths that are poisonous, like racism, for example. And I think uh, the myth of the autonomous individual is a mixed bag. Uh, there are many ways in which it, 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 it's very good, right? The, the, it emerges in part as a kind of liberatory movement against what we might call the more collectivist mindset of the medieval period in the West. You know, that, that's, that's how this development happens. And so you get the idea of, no, we are free individuals. And uh, this, this emerges as sort of part and parcel of modernity. Uh, what happens, it seems, is that the pendulum goes all then to the other extreme where now we all, uh, you know, we all have to have a car, we all have to have our own house, we all, you know, um, are thinking really about ourselves. And as, as you said, it's a kind of cult almost of, of the individual. And I think what we need to recover is the realization that uh, this was uh, something said by John Ruskin uh, back in the 19th century. And uh, it, was, uh, it was something that had an enormous influence on the thought of, of young uh, Mohandas Gandhi, which is that the good of the individual and the good of the whole are inseparable from one another. So if the individual is oppressed, we don't want that, right? We, none of us would be happy in an environment where we're unable to pursue the good as we envision it. Uh, at the same time, if we don't acknowledge that we're part of a larger whole, we will ultimately be reaping our own destruction by doing that, right? That our, our pursuit of our own individual liberty uh, at the expense of everyone else without any mindfulness to how we're affecting everyone else, uh, eventually we're, we're cutting the ground up from under ourselves because we also need to share this earth. We also need to, to live and to breathe and to have a, a suitable environment. And so uh, that, that means, um, you know, well, uh, uh, to, to again, bring Gandhi into the conversation, uh, acknowledging that there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. And uh, the religions, again, I think are great about developing an ethos in which we curtail some of our more grandiose individualist inclinations and channel them in a more uh, in a direction that's more constructive to the whole. Yeah. I heard to ask, oh, did you want to follow up, Maynard? Oh, yeah, the, the, and the notion of freedom um, seems to emerge as some sort of paramount value uh, in this conversation so that somebody who acknowledges that social dimension which you just mentioned and mm -hmm. and 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 the welfare of the whole being so important um it seems to have it seems to contrast with this notion of individual freedom that is that becomes so destructive yes um, because and, it's it's, it's become it's become unmoored from reality right it, it's it's come unmoored from the understanding that a condition of my freedom is the general well-being of the people around me and the community in which I exist. And that if I want to enjoy my freedom and my individuality, I also have a responsibility to help sustain that whole community. And, and myth thinking locally and globally. Yeah, yeah and, and that same myth blinds us to the ways in which our success has been because of inputs other than our own talents. Yes. Uh, very practical question. Connie Verka asks, can you provide an example of cross-cultural conversations in action that was successful? I think many of us would agree this approach is necessary, but how? How do you do it? Especially at the international level. For example, our progress on combating climate change seems to be hindered very much by the us versus them mentality. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I can I can certainly think of examples uh, that a lot of examples are on the small the sort of local level. And uh, I've participated uh, in some of those myself. Uh, I was for a time I uh, had the uh, privilege of serving on the board of our local Hindu temple. 
And uh, we had to engage in some cross-cultural cross conversation with local authorities when we wanted to uh, expand. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and people didn't understand what is this temple? What is it all about? And so having those kinds of conversations uh, made for a better, more, more habitable environment for everyone, uh, local people who had some amount of fear or misgiving about the Hindu community realized that the this was a beautiful community. These were lovely people that had many of the same values. Uh, so there was nothing to fear. Uh, and uh, then when that happened, the people in the Hindu community could also breathe more easily. Uh, this was especially in, in the wake of the synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh, which is not that far away from us. Uh, security became a big concern at, at the local temple because the other uh, is often viewed through a very hostile lens. And so if you are the other, if you are the minority, then this kind of conversation becomes a matter of survival. So I've been involved on, in that on the local level. Uh, when I'm thinking of a larger scale level, uh, the first thing I think of uh, in terms of CCC in action that was successful, uh, if, you, if I cast my mind back through world history, one thing that I see is uh, the Indian independence movement, which required Hindus, Muslims, Jains, Sikhs, people from across the various castes, all the various communities in India, to set aside longtime suspicions and rivalries and co cooperate and work together uh, toward the common goal of freedom. And what was so brilliant, I think, about Gandhi's movement is that even though the British Empire was the opponent, he refused to see individual Europeans as other. And in fact, anyone who wanted to join in and assist the independence movement could. So you have uh, English people, you have Westerners like Annie Besant, for example, from the Theosophical Society, serving as president of the Indian National Congress uh, more than once. Uh, she also helped co-found the uh, Banaras Hindu University in India. Uh, you have people like uh, the Reverend Charlie Andrews, uh, who was a good friend and associate of Gandhi's, an Anglican pastor, uh, but he joined the Indian independence movement, and there's a street named after him in Delhi today. Uh, so Gandhi's idea was that uh, the, the movement should not be us against them. It should be a recognition, well, the, the, based on the idea that once we all recognize our common humanity, then independence will come naturally, right? Because the British will realize, oh, we're doing something wrong here in this situation. Now, the tragedy, of course, the, is that 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 situation did not obtain for very long. And the old suspicions between the communities reared their head. And you get the partition of India and Pakistan and, you know, countless deaths. And so you have this moment of great hope happening. And then quickly after that, it, it degenerates into something exactly the opposite. So this also shows us that we can never stop, right? We can't say, okay, our cross-cultural conversation was successful. Now we can, you know, now, um, we're done. now we're done. Now we can put up our feet and just not worry. This is an ongoing effort uh, to sustain uh, I think the, the term sustainability is coming to my mind, not only of the planet, but of the conversation itself, uh, so that the learning can continue. And, and uh, with each new generation, these values of coexistence have to be re-inculcated, I think. Very briefly, it's a question for me. Would you agree that the scientific community, community is engaged in these kinds of conversations all the time in a, in a very narrow um, field of of dialogue, but but still I think science is one of those areas where, where that happens. Well I agree. And that's one of the that's one of the beautiful things about science is that science is science. And whether you're Hindu, whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you're not religious at all, whether you're Jewish, if you're a physicist, you're a physicist. And when you're talking to other physicists, you're having your physics conversation and it's it's determined by that. And I think that is a, is a beautiful thing. That is an example of cross-cultural conversation. Uh, at the same time, there's a sense in which science, the scientific community becomes its own culture. And then we need th these kinds of dialogues where you bring in a, you know, a crazy philosopher like me to, uh, <laughs> to be part of the conversation as well. Uh, but yes, I, I think that the, the, the example you've given is a very good one. 
Last question, and I may be mispronouncing the first name. It looks like Gil Waring asks, would you speak further about increasing wisdom as much as knowledge? And I just want to note that we're almost out of time. So Okay. So, well, this was near the end of Anindita's talk, and I think it was one of the most important things that she was saying, that uh, I take it that when she was speaking of knowledge, she was talking really about things like technology, you know, knowledge, things that can be sort of placed into a, a, a yes or no format, right? True or false. Uh, then uh, you get wisdom, which is more in, in these areas that are, harder to pin down, but areas of values, uh, the big questions of, okay, we know how to do all kinds of things, and we maybe know how a lot about how the body and the universe work, but what's it all about? Why are we here? What's the point? How should I spend my time uh, while I am here? So this is where wisdom pertains, and if we don't cultivate wisdom in those areas, uh, the risk we run, what I understood Anindita to be saying, was that we'll then use our knowledge for uh, often very destructive ends, to make better guns, bigger bombs, um, you know, even, even bigger factories that can produce more stuff using raw material. And without the wisdom, we don't stop to realize that uh, we may be inflicting great damage on, on the earth, on each other, and ultimately upon ourselves by doing that. And this wisdom is contained in, in all kinds of profound ways uh, in, in the world's traditions. Um, it's, an, it's an idea that sometimes gets misused, but the concept of karma, uh, the idea that through my actions, I am contributing to my own future. I think it's something that, you know, phrased in a form like that, I think, we can all agree that this is something that we're doing, right? That that through our actions today, we're shaping the world that our future selves will live in. And whether you believe in rebirth or not, or whether you're just thinking in terms of future generations, um, that this kind of wisdom is what we can find in religious traditions and cultural traditions that does not necessarily translate into knowledge of the sort of technical variety. Um, and uh, And sometimes this knowledge even goes beyond uh, logic. Uh, I was just teaching students today about Zen and uh, how you have the idea that there is a boundary to what the mind can actually comprehend conceptually, but that there are other realms of experience beyond that. And the whole point of the koan in the Rinzai Zen tradition is to you know, this reflect on this ultimately meaningless riddle, uh, which takes you to, to the end of conceptual thought but that's not the end. That's the jumping off point into something even more profound. So well, I think we'll yeah. have to leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Maynard to come back on and take us out. This has been very interesting and enlightening. Thank you very much for being here. And um, 